Hello and welcome everybody. I am so excited and pleased to have Shirley Lang with me today on our on our recording and on our Facebook Live for Fearless Ambition. So what's really exciting about Shirley is that she is the founder and CEO of Muses, which is a global creators network that helps entrepreneurs and creatives build and mobilize networks for growth. But Shirley is so much more than that. And I was just telling her as we were waiting to get everything hooked up that I have never seen <clears throat> a young woman with the set of credentials and work history that Shirley has had. So she has, well, first of all, I mean, Muses is already in 121 countries. I mean, can you believe that? That is mind boggling to me. And already with it over 300 million total social media network reach. I mean, those kind of numbers are just uh, astounding. It's hard to imagine them. She actually started her career at MySpace. So, you know, that's, she doesn't look old enough to have started her career at MySpace, but like, think about, think about what you would learn just working there as a young lady. Led teams at NBC and at Amazon. With, and she's also catapulted growth for a lot of actually thousands of YouTube stars. You know, my son, he uh, is a big fan of like so many YouTube influencers like Faze House or, you know, these different things. And you, I often imagine like, how do those people get so much growth? So the fact that you actually know how to do that is, uh, is reason enough for people to want to know more about you. So Shirley is a startup mentor at Techstars and is an advisor for women tech founders and do something.org. So today I'm going to be uh, just asking her some questions about this amazing career, but how, Hey, take it, take it from there. Tell us a little bit to start about muses. Well, first off, thank you so much, Mary, for having me. It's such an honor um, to be on your show. I mean, I was looking at your accolades and it's definitely something to aspire to. So congratulations on everything you've built so far. You are a role model to women and men around the world. So thanks for having me. Oh, my, my absolute pleasure. And uh, today's my birthday. So you are, you are, oh, happy birthday. Special, I feel like you're an extra special birthday for me today. Oh, I get to learn. Day. You know, I was just at a conference. Um, I was just at a conference in Toronto. I actually just got back late uh, Sunday night and um, I was speaking at this conference. But you know, the, the conference was for holistic medical doctors. So homeopath doctors, and there, it was very well attended. Lots of energy in the room and, you know, just to be in the presence of all of those healers. But you know, the number one thing that they were there to learn was all of the things that you probably know how to do instinctively. You know, all of those things about building followers, building a network, gaining credibility. These are all the, I mean, I wish that, uh, I hope that um, I get a chance to send all of them the video of us today, because this is exactly the kind of content that even though like they might be a chiropractor, they still need to know how to do this. This is no longer just what the top celebrities do. Don't you think this is the, the way that we're building our businesses and, uh, you know, reaching people, whether it's in a local community or a global community? You're absolutely right. And that's the reason why I started Muses. Essentially, any small business owner or self-employed worker if you want to grow and you don't have the time, the resources for social media or spending on Facebook ads, how do you get more eyeballs on your business, right? So let's say we start a Facebook page and we always invite our, I don't know, 30 or 50 friends to like our Facebook page. But now what? You know, you don't have thousands of dollars to spend on Facebook ads. So we need to find other people to help pull resources and grow together and one of the ways to do that is through influencers you know that word has been around for several years now it's still wild wild west for many um but i think the dust is starting to settle we're seeing more um you know templates template campaigns and different ways of 
uh, becoming that success story. So I saw this need in the market where it's not just for celebrities, like you said, and big brands. It's for the everyday people that want to build a brand online that has a side hustle, if you will, that one day they want to turn into their main hustle. You've got to have that social media and digital footprint. Whenever someone hears about your business, what's the first thing they do? They Google you. Right. For me, I look up to see if you have an Instagram page. I look at your content. I look at your engagement. I want to see if you're really what you say you are. Right. And I'm not alone. They say, you know, I, I think it was something like 75% of millennials would search on social media before they make a purchase decision. It's, it's something crazy like that. Um, and especially for women and moms, you know, we actually, I'm not a mom yet, but women actually make the purchasing decisions at home and we love social. So that just makes it so much more important for us small business owners, entrepreneurs, anyone who's trying to build a brand to have that solid foundation on these different platforms. It's, it's so true. And I can tell you that from that end user perspective, like the person like me that's just trying to figure it out, it can feel sometimes like your content and your message get buried underneath the, the um, brain power it takes to understand the text. So that's why I'm so in admiration for you because like you understand everything that you just said. You know, you understand that it's the woman making the purchases and you also understand emo like People say this all the time, but that we buy based on how we feel. And obviously social is the way that in today's word, we're creating those feelings. I mean, it used to be commercials on television and now it's on social. So it's definitely a changing paradigm. So for someone that has your background and your credibility, that's why I was saying that I cannot wait to see where you are at in 10 years years. I have a feeling <laughs> just the tip of the iceberg for you. Thank you. So having this rich history, <clears throat> and thank you so much for telling us about Muses. How did you get started in the beginning with like, you know, going to, to MySpace? What was your early start like? Okay. So I, my start was a lot of uh, zigzags and turns because like, like many people, we think we want to be something, but turns out not really the case. I mean, there are some select uh, fortunate people who just know what, what they want to do and they become that. For me, I started off um, as an engineer uh, at USC. So I have my undergrad in engineering and I graduated to go work at Fox Interactive who owned MySpace at the time. And this is in Beverly Hills. So I started off as a technical project manager and <laughs> it's working with developers, IT departments, mm -hmm. Um, gathering business requirements, you know, all of the, uh, you know, fun tech stuff that you can think of, um, essentially to support new features, deploy new um, products for different, you know, areas of the MySpace website and their portfolio companies that Fox Inter Interactive owned at the time. So, you know, I really, I always enjoy tech. I always saw that tech is the foundation for everything as well as going into the future. So that's why I wanted to make sure that I cope myself with a good foundation in technology. And so from then on, I realized that, okay, um, from a selfish standpoint, what is the most influential medium for, you know, for anyone? It's media, right? Media, a lot of times influences the way we think, the way we act, the way what we purchase. So that's why I wanted to stay within media companies. And that's when I went to Sony, NBC, you know, my goal was to hit all the major media studios and absorb and learn as much as I can, because I loved content creation. I love understanding the emotional aspect and audience development, right? How do you curate a community? How do you grow that community and be able to guide their sentiment about uh, either a topic, a conversation or a product, right? So that's what really fascinated me and drew, drew me into these various organizations. That is absolutely incredible. So the, like, the connection that you're making between all of these things, I think, is what's truly fascinating. And that you must have a lot of drive, 
you know, to yeah. go and work for these big name companies and get, get your foot in the door. And I wonder, or I'm getting the sense that you're going there was really like being a sponge and learning in all of these environments and just taking that in and helping you grow into what eventually turns into the highly successful Muses app. Oh, so, thank you. <laughs> oh, my pleasure. So what are the, what are some of the biggest tips you've learned from those huge companies that you use to take you into like your next step of your entrepreneurship journey? Okay. Well, I think that, you know, being at a big company, the, for me, the best thing is that there are so much more resources, um, you know, for you to be able to experiment and work with third party tools. So for example, when I was at NBC or at Sony, you know, you have a budget for your department, not like when you're a startup, you have a limited amount of budget. Um, you're able to choose different vendors that you think are state of the art or, you know, be able to look at what are the trends out there and how do we stay on top of that and be able to find the best vendor to work with you. I think that's one benefit of being in a large company. The other thing is when I was at Audible Amazon, we had a stellar engineering team and it's front and back end designers, QA team, you know, it's just, you know, the smartest people I've worked with. If you have a product idea, so I worked on the Audible app, do you use Audible? Oh, heck yes. Yes, yes. So, I mean, great for travels and falling asleep. Well, and, you know, actually, so even just at that homeopath uh, conference that I was at, it was called Impact yeah. Lives 2018. I mean, I can't tell you how many conversations that there were just about Audible, like how that is changing lives because um, <clears throat> most of the people that were at this conference were, in fact, women. <laughs> And most of these women were also, in fact, moms. And so they felt like the Audible app is, there's some, is something that they're so grateful for because it allows them to be a mom, run their businesses, but still take in that content that they, you know, like we're like sponges. We just want to learn everything right now. So it allows them to take that content in while they're taking a bath. Um, I'm so guilty yeah. of listening to Audible in the shower while you're walking or running or, you know, on the plane, on the train, in the car. It just one of those things. If you have 10 minutes you can pop it on and enjoy that 10 minutes of learning. And then you can just pick it up, you know, later on yeah. in the day. So yeah, thank yeah. you for all the development you did on that app. <laughs> oh, tiny, wow. tiny development that I did. <laughs> it's, all, you, it's all the team. <laughs> but like, this is what's blowing my mind. It's like, how many of us think about the engineering teams, like the details behind the details? I mean, we see the end product. We see how it works. But the amount of massive undertaking it must have been to collaborate with publishers, to collaborate with, you know, all the uh, legalities of publishing just in general. I mean, like, for example, I know that uh, I would love to record my book on Audible, but I also know that Hay House, my publisher, owns my content. So, you know, it's just, isn't it interesting, even just from a legal standpoint? All right. I cannot just uh, suck up all this time with my fascination with Audible, but like, you know, what I'm also hearing you say as you describe these like benefits of corporate life and inner workings is this term that I heard not too long ago called intrapreneur. Yes. So very, yeah. So I love that because it sounds like someone like you or someone with an entrepreneurial mind can actually take a position at one of these mega, mega superstar companies and still like have that ambition flourish, be rewarded for that ambition and grow, you know, grow through making teams, grow through being a part of a project. And later on to be able to say, I was a part of that. I mean, you were a part of something that's making history. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, it is a definitely incredible feeling. I think for me, back to the drive, sometimes I call myself a masochist. If I don't feel busy enough, if I don't feel frustrated, then I feel like I'm not doing enough. I don't know <laughs> what it is, but I think we're hardwired that way as entrepreneurs or entrepreneurs to always push the boundaries for ourselves and people around us. Yeah, that's, I mean, I think that it's what's behind how I came up with fearless ambition in the first place, because you never know what's behind that next door. And, and you, might, um, you might feel the fear because you don't know what's coming, but yet there's something that pushes you through anyway. It's, it's about having the courage 
to, it's about having the courage to always put one foot in front of the other and take that next step rather yeah. than trying to be fearless or pretend that we don't have any of those fears. So, all right. Well, thank you so much. And it, okay. So let's talk about growing a platform because I know that um, if I were having lunch with you, I would be begging you to tell me about a little bit more about uh, a platform because you've worked with such very impressive organizations and building your own very impressive more organization and actually sounds like involved in more than one. So what are what, what is one of the most successful platform building strategies that you have found? Okay. So I think for me, platform starts with content. So if we're talking about building a platform, in my mind, it's building an audience and building people who are engaged and will come back and interact with you. So content, whenever you're building a platform, whenever something is public, you got to think of it as putting out your best content, your professional content. Even if you're an individual and you're a blogger and you're starting your Instagram page, you got to think what, how do I make it look professional and brand friendly, right? Is this something that other people want to follow? Um, so one trick that I always ask, so I mentor at 1871, a startup pub here in Chicago. And whenever startups come to me and say, hey, how can I improve my Instagram? My first question is actually back to them. What do you want people to feel? Give me three adjectives to describe your brand, right? Once you can give those three adjectives, you can have unlimited amount of content ideas. So a lot of times, let's say a health food brand, right? They, they're only posting their food. All right. I'm like, well, you're going to run out of content sometime because you only have, I don't know, five different menu items. What are you going to post those same five things in different lighting, you know? So think about the emotional aspect. You want people to feel wholesome, um, inspired, and maybe, you know, delighted. You know, those are three adjectives I just came up with for wholesome food, right? So with that, you can think of uh, inspirational images that make you feel that way. So look on Instagram, look online, whatever makes you feel delighted, inspired, and wholesome. Those are the images that you want to add to your feed, not just, you know, photos of the product over and over again. So that's one thing that I've seen helps people. Um, the other thing is distribution. So you can't just market yourself all the time, right? Distribution, think about um, there's paid, earned, and owned content. Content, your content is the only owned, right? Paid content would be ads or using influencer marketing. Um, earned content is definitely the top, right? Earned is when someone sees your content either through your own channel or paid channels and actually create their own, right? So another term for this is UGC user generated content when someone sees a brand do something or use a hashtag to say hey show me your you know fall style and using that hashtag and you actually create something to generate more content um, using the same pillar or the same brand initiative that's when you earn the content and that's your goal as a brand marketer or a brand owner to be able to collect these earned content and inspire people to create earned content that is so brilliant. And I think that you have an ability to explain it because you know what? Instagram can be confusing to people. You know, I, I know that at this conference that I just went at and other ones that I've been at, there'll be this confusion of trying to create images that are popular or trending. Like, like so for example, let's say you're not a health food restaurant or you're not like a healthy eating uh, program, but you're just, uh, you're just an author. Then there might be this trend of like, posting yourself at different dinners or, you know, making, taking a picture of your food and posting it, but, or also creating this, um, fake sort of lifestyle that isn't really real. But yeah. if like, so for someone like me, if I think about what are, what is my audience going through? Maybe they're going through some struggles. Um, maybe they need to have, you know, some kind of transformation or they're, they're in the middle of that journey. So I just choose three adjectives that I think embody what my audience is about and then create that scenery through whatever lifestyle images that I can share or things that represent. So like I'm all about connection. So I could be posting a lot about things that create a connection. You know, and then sometimes that's not even directly maybe about 
something that I teach as an influencer, but it could be like, what is the connection between say the uh, uh, molecular structure of an atom? How is that connected to like the massive, um, you know, cosmos? If you've ever yeah. seen one of those things, I know I'm reaching here, yeah. but uh, it makes sense to me because what you're saying is just like so proudly, profoundly giving me ideas as to what other content that I could post on social media. Awesome. So let's talk about, cause you just gave some really incredible information. And like I said, I can't wait to get this out to a lot of my friends, but what is, what is a big mistake that you see over and over again? Okay. Um, I think, there, there are two. Can I share two? <laughs> yes, and especially if I'm doing one of them because I love to learn. No. Well, number one is a lot of people are perfectionists, right? Especially yes. if you're type A, you want everything to be perfect. But because your perfectionism can be a hindrance to you when you're scared to put out content. When everything needs to be perfect, a lot of times it's not authentic. And when people see you, it's just too made up. Or you don't pump out content, you know, frequently enough. And you just go and it's just this perfect thing it's hard to relate to. So that's number one. Number two is when it comes to influencer marketing or working with influencers, brands love to say, hey, let's do a test, right? When they say test, that means a small budget and which is fine, but you have to be careful because knowing that you're spending little, it's not going to move the needle so much. So what I see the mistake is they'll do a test and then expect huge results, but don't and then decide that it's not working and they don't try ah. it. So for example, if you have a small budget of let's say a couple hundred to a thousand dollars, right? Mm -hmm. You're not going to be able to find, you know, large enough influencers or with large enough engagement to really move the needle, right? So then you just see a couple likes here and there to you. It's, I don't know what happened, right? So that's a, that's a really good point because, you know, here's something that can separate the small influencers or the people that are, you know, using it because they're not going to have the enormous budget that, um, a large, a large brand, say like Tony Robbins or somebody that yeah. that's going to have, or Gary V. So yeah. there are those people that are in that starting out phase and that, um, they need to understand maybe to come up with a different strategy, do you think, if they only have a small budget? It's like, what are other, is there another way you think they could test their audience? Absolutely. To... So from a, a brand's perspective, right? So the, it's two-sided marketplace. The brand perspective, if you don't have that big of a budget, um, definitely provide product in exchange. Mm. If, let's say, if let's say you only have $1,000 to spend, spend that, you know, $1,000 on the biggest influencer you can get or even paid distribution. And then you're better off just doing a sampling program with 200 small micro or nano influencers. So then these influencers who are just starting off, just getting their feet wet, they're happy to do a brand campaign by receiving a product in exchange for social promotion. This way you're not spending a thousand dollars on one person getting one piece of content. You're getting, giving product to 200 people and you're getting 200 pieces of content right there you can regram them or you can you know reuse the content make sure you have the uses rights to distribute um but you, you get better bang for your buck if you can use smaller influencers when you have a smaller budget it makes sense but just making sure that whatever you're trading for is worth their effort as well right if so do you just as an example do you mean like someone like me would send out something for like i would find 200 small influencers that are similar to me have similar audiences to me yeah. and offer to send them all like either one of my courses or my book or something that they would then throw a shout out on their social it says hey uh, check out mary shore's book or something like is that what you mean absolutely oh and wow girl that's I mean, all the time talk yeah. about thinking outside of strategy this is this is the way people become like gary v is because they think of alternative strategies that aren't necessarily the mainstream yeah Absolutely. And, you know, we call these in-kind exchanges or barters, right? If you don't have a product, provide, maybe you provide a service or an experience, right? It's all about sampling, giving people value so they can talk about you. Mm -hmm. And, and something more than just like a free opt-in, something that's, yeah. something that's really um, impactful. 
Yeah, something to make the influencer feel special because nowadays influencers are getting pitched left and right. You know, yes, they have, yes. they have, I mean, you have a lot of options. So how do you decide who to work with? It needs to be worth your time. Well, and I can tell you that um, when you make the mistake of working with too many, you lose people. So I had gotten, um, personally, I had gotten bombarded with so many offers to do online summits, you know, like exclusive interviews. So I had already been on uh, over 200 podcasts. And then I started doing just one online summit after another, after another. Other. And that's wonderful. I love doing the interviews. It's so much fun. But having to promote those through my email list was making, was losing some of the uh, email chain. So it's like learning that great mixture of if you're an influencer too, you have to choose the best partners that are most in alignment with what your goals are and make sure that you're being good to your audience. So thank oh, you for mentioning so that. Because, yeah, because that's something I had just went through. Okay. So you've already told us a little bit about the Muses app, but you founded it. And so take us away. Tell us again, just a, what is, who would this app be great for and where do you see it going? Okay. So Muses is for self-employed workers, entrepreneurs, creators, really the freelance economy. Anyone who doesn't fit necessarily under the LinkedIn corporate umbrella should come to Muses. Uh, you know, we started off as an influencer platform, but then I saw, you know, these influencers are also doing other things. I mean, how many bloggers do you know who are also photographers? They're also PR specialists. They're also hairstylists. They're makeup artists. You know, like we have so many talented people in the world and they don't find jobs off of LinkedIn right? They a lot of times find jobs off of Instagram, but it's not designed for, you know, well, and job they, matchmaking. They find, they find jobs through their network. Yes. You know, through their connection, through, through their followers who are, who are enjoying their content. You know, I think I was actually giving a book talk. I was giving a speech and someone came up, I believe, and showed me your app. Ooh. Um, yeah. And I, she was like, look, you can connect with all of these people who, and she, she actually uh, referred to it as like almost like a dating app. She loved it so much. Awesome. Yeah. Like well, she was so excited hear. about it. Yeah. She was ex like telling me you should get a profile and um, yeah, but like, yeah, it was like, she was so excited about the possibility of who she could connect with. And she was excited. I mean, that's the thing is like getting excited about something new. Mm -hmm. is, is uh, priceless, right? Thank you. Thank you. Oh. All right. And what do you think, what do you think that you're doing right that is making this app so successful already? Well, we have a lot to grow, but so far we have 40,000 members in 121 countries. 85% is in the U.S. I mean, that just comes with the territory because we're here. Um, how we started off is my first 500 members were all my blogger friends. And we started off as influencer marketing. And, you know, it's a natural network effect. When you have influencers, your followers join, they attract the brands that they work with and became a two-sided marketplace. But we're pivoting from marketplace to, like you said, a LinkedIn network type place. So now we're attracting more small business owners, um, self-employed workers, freelancers, right? I think really it's the organic effect where people see something that they like, they invite their friends to connect. Or, you know, there's actually a need when, you know, a small business owner can't afford to pay a high-end photographer. They want to do barters, you know, yes. they'll say, hey, can I give you a fall, you know, wardrobe <laughs> for in exchange for a couple hours of your work, right? And so on Muses, you can pay someone for work or you can exchange, like we talk about complimentary services, product or experiences for work. And at the same time, you can also, you know, find people you want to connect and grow with. It's, it's so brilliant. You know, on podcasts, I think a lot lately people ask me questions about business because I've been a CEO for the past 20 years. So, e I mean, even though I'm an author and like a little baby influencer at this point, you know, I love how Reed Tracy always says it takes 10 years to become an, an overnight sensation. And a lot of times I feel like I'm on about year three or four of that journey. But, you know, the thing is that I've learned is like we're going through this paradigm shift in business. Now, if you're, um, if you grew up in the eighties and the nineties, you would have loved to play Monopoly. 
And the thing is that the only way to win the game of Monopoly is you have to bankrupt all your friends, (laughs) right? But like this new paradigm of business is not looking at everyone as competition, but yeah. looking at looking at your network and look at people either as connectors, collaborators, or or potential clients. Yes. And you can get everyone in those different categories, and then have a strategy for how you're going to interact with each with each kind of category. You can find yourself just really making a lot of progress just by utilizing the power of your own network. You know, that, that who you're in proximity to is like currency today. Don't you think? It is. It's all about who you know. And I love what you said. The whole genesis of community over competition or collaboration over competition. I can't tell you how many times, you know, people can say they want to copy someone else or they are in a similar business, but it doesn't matter because it all comes down to business execution. And someone can copy you today, but they have no idea what you have planned for the next five years. So I think instead of being- And they don't, and they don't have your story. Exactly. You know, no they don't one have has, your background. No one has your story. No one has your set of life circumstances. No one perceives the world quite the way you do. You know, I am all about helping as other aspiring authors, people who w- would like to write books or someone like yourself who just has all of this incredible knowledge that could help a lot of people. You know, when I first got started at 24 years old, um, starting my first company, I had a lot to learn. And, you know, it's like they look up to those people who've already accomplished some of these things to give back. It's such a great, writing a book is such a great way to give back. But so many potential authors will say, oh, you know, Gary Vee already wrote that book or, you know, Brene Brown already wrote that book. When the truth is no one can write your same book. No one has your same content. Some of the concepts may be the same. And that's a brilliant thing because Louise Hay herself, founder of Hay House Publishing, would talk about how it's so important that we're all sharing the same information because one person is going to radiate with me. Yep. And another person is going to resonate with, with someone else. And yep. so our stories, our, lot, our life circumstances, including the more traumatic things that we've been through in our lives, the lessons that we've learned the hard way, those are the things that, that create your audience almost like a magnet. Uh, one, of my, one of my friends in the podcasting industry, I love how she said, it's like, it's like a platform is like a big empty football stadium. And you're just filling those seats one person at a time with people who are becoming your fans. And why do they become, you know, I know we don't like the word fan, but why do they become a follower? It's because they resonate with the power of your story. There's something that you have learned yourself that you can share with them. So take us away. Give us, um, what is the number one tip for anyone who's learning to build an online business? Number one tip. I want to say, um, So this changes, right? But right now for this present day, it's very important to be kind. Oh, yes. And authentic. Yes. I think your message comes through and who you are comes through. You can't say, oh, I'm a, you know, I'm this type of person online, but I'm a different person offline. I think people are looking for, um, like you said, a message that resonates with them. So you have to be the same person online and offline and kindness attracts so much more than glamor or, you know, of course, success, but success can come with jealousy, right? But if you're kind, I think the connections that you make through there um, reciprocate. Yes. And, you know, I, I had a moment, uh, maybe just about two or three weeks ago, I had this moment, uh, my assistant, Soraya, she's actually the queen of all content creation around here and has the ultimate authority. And uh, I had this moment, I I was reading over a post and I consider myself to be a content machine just because, I mean, I like to talk. I was that kid that was, you know, on my report card, it said talking too much. Um, (laughs) And so like, how fun is it that I, today I happen to be talking to you. Perfect. (laughs) But I had this, um, I had this moment a few weeks ago and I was reading this post and it said something about a dream life. 
you know, yes, because like writing a book and publishing it with Hay House is definitely a dream come true. I mean, I always had this kind of like secret, secret inner desire to be a motivational speaker. And like, who knew that the universe would start providing such an opportunity for someone like me that's just like sitting in my debt, you know, sitting at my desk in the Midwest to be broadcasting all over the world and talking to someone like you. We have no reason that we would have ever met each other, right? But like, I'm looking at this post and it's talking about like this dream life. And I was like, wait a second. Because one of the biggest things that's getting me is everyone claiming that they live this life of their dreams, you know, and I make all this money. And if you just do what I say and you buy my program, then you can make all this money too. Mm -hmm. And I realized in that moment that it was time to say that as far as being an author and the things that I'm learning and sharing with my message, it's not about living that perfect dream life. It's about understanding that the more that you learn, the more you understand what to do, when to do it and how to, and how to execute that, the more confident you become from within, the more empowerment you create because everything that you create from a place of empowerment is going to show up stronger, faster, better, and have a longer lasting impact on yourself and the world. And what that does, the way that feeds you back is it doesn't make you have a dream life because there's always problems. There's always moments when shit hits the fan. But what it does do is it makes your moment to moment existence more beautiful than it's ever been before because you understand you have the power to create what you want and to just learn one step at a time. You have a goal, you have a theme, you have something that you're trying to create. Listen to people like Shirley folks, because like the information that she just gave us today is absolutely over the top. And I just cannot thank you enough for being here. I'm so glad I got the opportunity to meet you. Everyone check out the Muses app. I know that we have it posted. Everyone who signed up will get the uh, replay for this. And I actually have just in mind a group of people I want to send it out to too. So, okay, Shirley, any last words? Well, Mary, what you just said definitely hit home so much. Um, one last thing I will say is I saw somewhere the definition, redefinition of a billionaire instead of making a billion dollars is impacting uh, a billion people. So I think having, like you said, your purpose and being able to succinctly and confidently walk towards your purpose that's how you're able to build that platform and impact so many more people. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay, hang on with me just a second. Great. So I can give you a proper goodbye. <laughs>